You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. Hello, and welcome to episode 351 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. African chattel slavery, the predominant type of slavery practiced in colonial North America and the early United States, didn't just represent one monolithic practice of slavery. Practices of slavery varied by region, labor systems, legal codes, and empire. Slavery also just wasn't about enslavers enslaving people for their labor. Enslavers used enslaved people to make statements about their social status as areas of economic investment that built generational wealth, and as a form of currency. Nicole Maskeel, an associate professor of history at the University of South Carolina, and the author of Bound by Bondage, Slavery and the Creation of the Northern Gentry, joins us to investigate the practice of slavery in Dutch New Netherland and how the colony's elite Dutch families built their wealth and power on the labor, skills, and bodies of enslaved Africans and African Americans. During our investigation, Nicole reveals details about the colony of New Netherland and its role within the Dutch Empire, the Dutch practice of slavery in New Netherland, and how New Netherland's elite families used enslaved people beyond their labor to create and maintain generational wealth. But first, in case you missed our happy news in the last episode, Ben Franklin's World is now a part of the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation and Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. As the new founding director of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios, my job is to continue to produce this podcast, as well as to build and lead a team who will produce more digital programs about early American history. So please continue to look for new episodes of Ben Franklin's World every other Tuesday, and stay tuned for future announcements about new digital exhibits and programs. You'll be among the first to hear about these new projects, too, because we'll announce them right here on this podcast. Okay. Are you ready to explore the many ways that enslaved Africans and African Americans built the wealth of colonial North America and the early United States? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. Our guest is an associate professor of history and the Peter and Bonnie McCausland Fellow at the University of South Carolina. She specializes in the colonial history of the North American Northeast and focuses much of her research on the overlapping networks of slavery in the Dutch and British Atlantic worlds. Today, she joins us to discuss these networks with details from her book, Bound by Bondage, Slavery and the Creation of the Northern Gentry. Welcome to Ben Franklin's world, Nicole Maskeel. Well, thank you so much for having me. I've been a longtime fan, and I'm very excited to be here. Well, we're excited to have you, too. Now, I guess we should start by saying that your book, Bound by Bondage, investigates the significance of family and Dutch colonial networks and how these families used slavery as a form of currency to shape the social, cultural, and political development of the early American Northeast across generations. So, Nicole, as much of our exploration is going to center in Dutch New Netherland, I wonder if you could provide us with an overview of New Netherland and its establishment. Yes. So the colony of New Netherland was established in 1614 and is originally colonized by, in large part, the West India Company. New Netherland was actually part of a larger system of enslavement, of colonization that spanned the Western Dutch Empire from Recife and Brazil and other locations through the Caribbean islands like Curaçao and into North America. So New Netherland is part of this larger empire. But the colony of New Netherland gets started by a very small number of people coming primarily from the Dutch Republic. And this notion of it being a Dutch project, in some ways it is, but it's also a diverse group of people who are coming from Europe and coming over to what is now New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and parts of Connecticut in order to create a foothold in the North American continent. 
I think the diversity of New Netherland always surprises people. I know when I was reading about the history of New Netherland that there's this one scholar who gives a figure of 52% of New Netherland is actually settled by Dutchmen from the Netherlands. And while other scholars have disputed this scholar's exactness of the accounting, they all agree that New Netherland was a very diverse colony and it wasn't just filled by people from the Netherlands. That's exactly right. Now, what role did the Dutch West India Company play in establishing the government and society of this colony? You mentioned that they played a pretty big role in populating the colony, but what role did it play in establishing the cultural norms and governance of the colony? You do have some people coming over as private individuals, and the governance of the colony is really directed by the West India Company, which was a company (laughs) that had a board of directors, that had in the North American context, somebody who sort of been seen as a governor, you have several people filling that role with the person having the actual title of director general being Peter Stuyvesant. He's probably the most famous of these people. These leaders and the colony really had to answer to the board <laughs> back in the Dutch Republic, what is now the Kingdom of the Netherlands. So in that sense, It was very different. And you see the actions of the West India Company being driven by the financial interests of their their investors in a way that isn't as prominent in any other colony. Well, now that we have an idea of New Netherlands settlement and governance, why did the Dutch establish this colony? What was its importance going to be for their larger Dutch Atlantic empire? We like to think, especially people like me, with the roots that tie to New York, we like to think of it as being kind of the center of the universe, or as Russell Swarto put it, the center of the world. But in this context, New Netherland really wasn't. It was really an outpost in the kind of broader scheme of Dutch imperial claims. But it did help to provision or send resources to other places in the empire. So you do see them providing things like grain and other provisions, but this isn't a huge enterprise. It really was a fledgling place. And of course, the most prominent economy coming out of Dutch New Netherland was the fur economy. So it isn't the center of anything, (laughs) but it certainly does have economic function. And you see the proceeds of some of these functions even appear in the paintings, right, of what most people know as the Dutch Golden Age, like the Vermeers, Rembrandt. All of these paintings show, you know, people in these big festooned hats that were made possible by the proceeds from the colony of New Netherland. In addition to being this outpost for provisions and peltry for the larger Dutch Atlantic world, another big aspect of the New Netherland economy was, of course, slavery. And in your book, Bound by Bondage, you claim that Dutch slavery came to the North American Northeast long before the Dutch had actually established the colony of New Netherland. So Nicole, how was this possible? Can you tell us about Dutch slavery and how it was able to come to the North American Northeast before the Dutch ever established their colony at New Netherland? I sought to try to follow the story of enslavement in the Dutch context and complicate some of the expectations of when it appeared, because the expectation to trade commodities and enslaved people really arrived with early European mariners, even going back to the voyages of Columbus. I start my tale of the enslavement in the Dutch context with Dutch mariner Hendrik Christiansen, who also held these expectations when he arrived in 1611, which was three years before the colony of New Netherland was formed. Now, he was acting on behalf of a Dutch company named the Van Twehausen Company. This is a company that actually predates the more famous West India Company that I discussed. And he was trying to get into, surprise, surprise, the fur trade to make money for his employers. Now, he figured while he was doing so, he would take the opportunity to kidnap two indigenous boys, referred in several works as Muncie, which is a term that overlaps with groups who would later form the Delaware and the Lenni Lenape. And he wants to bring these captive boys back to Amsterdam and to put them on display. Mind you, there's really nothing exclusively Dutch about what he's doing. English mariners had famously done this in the case of Epinal and Martha's Vineyard. But this kind of ad hoc, opportunistic-driven approach 
certainly came to define the way that enslavement unfolded in the Dutch colony of New Netherland and across the Dutch Atlantic world. So that's kind of why I begin it there, but certainly in conversation with other people who are starting to reevaluate the entwined nature of indigenous and African enslavement at these early 17th century moments. But it did seem like in your book, Bound by Bondage, that Dutch slavery and the practice of slavery was a bit different from, say, how the French or the Spanish or even the English colonies practiced slavery. So could you talk to us about Dutch slavery and why it seemed to be this distinct practice from the way other Europeans practiced it? Yeah, I really like this question because in some ways, enslavement in the early 17th century looked similar in terms of the general notion of getting captive people in order to increase productivity and profits in a way that could then be replicable on a larger and larger scale. But in the Dutch context, you do get the company being the largest slaveholder in the region, the Dutch West India Company. And that creates a group of enslaved people who are then owned by the company. This group of enslaved people have been researched before and looked at before, most recently by Andrea Mosterman in her book, Spaces of Enslavement. But these company enslaved people and the practices the company had with enslavement created spaces for things like collective bargaining to a certain extent, for enslaved people to have different types of opportunities to petition the company for a redress, whether it be in in light of long service or service during warfare. And you don't get that in other colonies. That being said, some of the results of this kind of company type style enslavement is that You do have a group of private people in the colony who are increasingly wanting to have access to enslaved people to the point where they even get money together to finance a slaving voyage themselves because there is a general desire for enslavement. So I would say the largest difference in terms of the context is while in the English and Spanish and the French context, you have a lot more private interests working to bring in enslaved people, you have this kind of company aspect of it that directs and changes the culture of the way that slavery unfolds. I'm really glad that Nicole brought up Andrea Mosterman because in episode 324, Andrea told us all about the Dutch West India Company and the role that the company played in establishing slavery in New Netherland. So when we look at Nicole's book, Bound by Bondage, Nicole is really furthering this story by focusing on a handful of elite Dutch families who used personal slaveholding to build networks of power throughout the colony and throughout the Dutch Atlantic world. Nicole, could you tell us about these families that you researched and why you chose these particular families to study? The families that I chose, these are people with names like Stuyvesant, Van Rensselaer, Schuyler, Livingston. These are some of the most famous families in New York history. So just riding down the interstate, if you're in the area, or walking through the streets of New York City, or even listening to the soundtrack of Hamilton, you're going to gain at least a passing familiarity with some of these family names. But I was intrigued by the Stuyvesants because Petrus or Peter Stuyvesant was the last Dutch governor, or more specifically, director general of the colony of New Netherland, which At its fall included the Caribbean islands of Curaçao, Aruba, and Bonaire. I was interested in the Stuyvesants also because Stuyvesant was a large slaveholder. And up till now, though it it is definitely changing, the narrative around him had been one that, while recognizing that he owned enslaved people, was certainly not a narrative around enslavement. The Van Rensselaer family, who are the owners of Rensselaersvik, a massive landholding in the upper Hudson Valley. The Schuyler family as well become prominent landowners in and around Albany, and they intermarry with the Livingstons in the late 17th century. And so I knew that this was going to be a kind of Baroque, intertwined story that had resonance for today as well, because so many of these families and their stories continue to shape at least American legal and political cultures and are certainly part of the kind of discussions around founding narratives that we are now currently in the midst of having. 
that's really interesting to pick one family, particularly the Stuyvesants, who end up marrying and entwining themselves with most of the families that we would encounter in early New York and New York City. When I studied New York, you would look at like the family tree of the Schuylers or the Cowlers or the Von Cortlands, and you would just see all of these different family tree branches connecting and intertwined and knotted together because they just keep marrying each other generation after generation. So starting with the Stuyvesants and looking at their role as enslavers and what they do to bring slavery to New Netherland, that's a really interesting window in which to look on the development of slavery in this colony. That's so true. It's so true. I was so surprised. I feel like I got into genealogy in a big way doing this book and being surprised to say, oh, these two people were cousins and these two people were brothers. And oh, wow, how are they lacing back? It really was an entwined family tree. Now, in her book, Bound by Bondage, Nicole argues that these elite families, the Stuyvesants, the Schuylers, the Cowlers, the Tenikes, the Von Cortlands, really, we could go on and on with these famous families. But these families used slavery to shape the development of elite culture in the early Northeast and really to shape the region's social and political cultures as well. Nicole, would you tell us about the practice of slavery as exercised by these Dutch colonial families and what made their practice of slavery unique when we put it in the scheme of all the colonies that are in North America? In some ways, this is an odd approach into these families. Most people historically have thought about these families as mainly traders, people whose portfolios involved indigenous trade, involvement in the fur trade. And if they did slavery, the conversation was they kind of dabbled in it. But one thing I was surprised to find is that these families were investing in enslavement, either through slaving voyages or directly with owning considerable numbers of enslaved people at the beginning in a pretty big way. They are rooting themselves in places where the slave trade is becoming increasingly important and putting satellite members, for example, beginning with the Stuyvesant family, Petra Stuyvesant gets his start actually in Brazil and then moves over to Curaçao, which is in the Southern Caribbean, right above Venezuela. And He really cuts his teeth in this environment that, in later decades, really becomes a center for the Dutch slave trade. It wasn't that when he was there, but as his life is moving on and he becomes the director general of New Netherland, his eldest son, Balthazar, makes his start and actually lives his whole life in the Caribbean, investing with his cousin, Nicholas Baird, in slaving voyages. And this is the story for many of the other families as well that they are investing in enslavement, they're investing in the slave trade, but they're also making a claim to slavery where they're at. You see that they have usually among the largest slave holdings. And now we're not talking about Dutch New Netherland, we're not talking about massive land holdings with 400 people, but as a proportion of the whole population, these people are holding more than most people have access to. And so In that sense, slavery is a consistent and important part of not only the economic portfolios of these families, but also the ways in which they establish their foothold in society. Could we talk a bit more about these families' economic portfolios, as you put it? You argue in Bound by Bondage that these elite families used enslaved people to establish wealth in different trade networks across the Dutch Atlantic world. And I wonder if you could tell us more about the specifics of how they used enslaved people to establish wealth in different trade networks around the Dutch Atlantic world. There are a couple of points here that I think are really important to understand. The first is that enslaved people, human beings, were used by other human beings at times as a form of liquidity. They were used as surety for loans and capital. And you even see this very directly in the laws of early Rensselaersvik and the Beberwijk, what becomes Albany. You also see that these elite families are sending enslaved people to advance their economic interests. For example, I have an example from the Stuyvesant family where 
Peter Stuyvesant sends a couple named Lucia and Joseph, and he sent them from New Amsterdam, from his bowery in what is now Lower Manhattan, to tend cattle, really to take charge is actually the word used, of cattle and pasture down in Curacao. You have these elite families or people who go on to be very powerful, also using enslaved people and their ties to slavery to cement cross-colonial connections. And it's not just into the Caribbean. You have them doing this in places like New England and trying to get a foothold in these types of economies, trading enslaved people for things like pork and as part of negotiations that are cross-colonial. So enslaved people are being used in a myriad of ways, and they're being not just used as themselves, as capital for investments, but their time, their talent, right, their skills are being utilized in order to push forward the economic interests and really also the social interests of these families. So if we look at this history of slavery through the perspective of a Dutch enslaver, We'd see a lot of economic value in each enslaved person. An enslaved person was someone who could perform labor, as you said. They also had talents and skills that they could bring to bear on the enslavers' trading networks. And enslaved people themselves could establish trading networks because of the great demand for enslaved people in both North America and the Caribbean. So if you're involved in this slave trade, you can connect with different people who want enslaved people. And you can also use your enslaved people as collateral and hire them out or sell them to pay your bills as a form of currency. In fact, if we think about it in that way, as an enslaver, you could view an enslaved person, this human being, as really a multidimensional form of currency. That's right. There's really a lot of creativity, horrible creativity, that is put forward to maximize the gain that is extracted from these people's lives. Did the knowledge that enslaved people represented so much financial value for their families impact the way that Dutch enslavers treated their enslaved people? Did Dutch enslavers treat their enslaved people better, knowing that they were worth so much money to their families? You know, this is a really interesting question because I think in the past there certainly was a perception that Dutch enslavement under the auspices of the West India Company and also under kind of Dutch New Netherland was in some cases milder because enslaved people, especially those who were owned by the Dutch West India Company, did have access to a kind of collective bargaining network. They were able to petition the courts. They had access to marriage, to the church, which was crucially important for making connections between them. But whether or not this stems from the elite families' investment in enslaved people, I tend to take that with a little bit of a grain of salt because you see that as the Dutch period winds to an end, after the fall of Dutch New Netherland, these elite families don't disappear. (laughs) They continue to grow and to thrive, but their attitudes and actions towards enslaved people become, in the form of the legal edifice of the colony, increasingly draconian putting through legislation that really enacts some pretty horrific things on enslaved people like being burned at the stake, public branding, public whipping. You don't see the death rate that you get in the Caribbean in terms of how many people are dying as a result of labor practices. But the mortality figures are not anything to sneeze at. In fact, probably one of the more Prominent examples of this would be the arrival of the slave ship Gideon or the Gideon that comes in right at the fall of New Netherland. In fact, Peter Stuyvesant blames the fall of the colony to the ship, and the people are described as half starved. They are suffering from disease. And you do see this aspect of it. You also see evidence of enslaved people suffering from things like frostbite, malnutrition. So I definitely think that on some level, elite people were investing in enslavement and they had to tend that investment. But how that worked in terms of the daily life that enslaved people had in the colony, it still was a very difficult and dreadful life. 
You've mentioned a few times that New Netherland falls to the English, and the fall of New Netherland is an event that we know as the English conquest of New Netherland, which happened in 1664. We should dig in to this conquest of New Netherland and how that impacted the way these elite families use slavery to increase their wealth. But first, we really need to take a moment to thank our episode sponsor. As we discuss how Africans and African Americans built the wealth of the early United States, it seems fitting to highlight a wonderful exhibition at the art museums of Colonial Williamsburg. It's called I Made This, the work of Black American artists and artisans. I Made This celebrates the lives of Black American artists and artisans through the material culture that they made between the 18th and 20th centuries. Objects and works included in the I Made This exhibition include nearly 30 examples of paintings, furniture, textiles, decorative sculptures, quilts, tools, and metal goods. And this exhibition doesn't just feature the great work created by Black Americans. It also includes their personal stories. To learn more about this wonderful exhibition and how you can see it, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash I made this. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash I made this. Nicole, would you tell us about the English conquest of New Netherland in 1664 and how New Netherland came under the jurisdiction of the English crown? Yes, I find this event so fascinating, not the least of which because you know, it happened without really much of us at all. There wasn't an actual battle. There was no pitched battle that occurred. But instead, there was a siege of New Netherland, New Amsterdam, really, where Peter Stuyvesant really wants to fight and other members of his community, most prominently highlighted by Dr. Susanna Shaw Romney in her book, New Netherland Connections, that these people were maybe not so motivated to try to come up against this larger force. And what was interesting to me is during this fall, two things happen in regards to enslaved people. The first is that a group of people who had been owned by the West India Company had been given a kind of conditional freedom, which was they and their wives were freed, but they had to pay a certain tax to the company, but their children would be enslaved. These people were able to negotiate at the fall full freedom for themselves and their family. So that was one thing that was interesting. The other thing that was interesting was that there was actually a deposition made after the fall by people who lived in the kind of village that surrounded the Stuyvesant's Bowery. And they said that they remembered that Stuyvesant had his enslaved African people threshing wheat and that they were willing to make this claim under oath. And so this image of enslaved people threshing wheat. And Stuyvesant actually goes so far as to force the white inhabitants of Dutch New Netherland to work alongside enslaved people to shore up the city, which must have been a grievous blow to these colonists who were used to this being actually something that happened to criminals, right? If you were accused of a violent crime in the colony, you were often forced or sometimes forced to work in the chain alongside enslaved people who were working in a chain gang. So this moment of the fall of Dutch New Netherland, for me, these two images First, of this group of enslaved people who are able to get their freedom, and second, of this group of enslaved people who are forced to thresh wheat, and then the white colonists alongside, just really shows both the desperation of the moment, but also the kind of need for shoring up security in that moment. And Stuyvesant may have done what he could to shore up New York, but it still falls to the English in 1664. So what did this transfer from Dutch power to English power mean for the families and the enslaved people that you study? What did this transfer of power mean for the Dutch culture, language, laws, governance, and their practice of slavery, these cultural attributes, once this colony goes from being Dutch to English? In the beginning, not much changed. With the fall of the colony, The Dutch population, or the population who'd been there under the Dutch control, who spoke Dutch, they were able to retain a certain level of autonomy over their institutions, while English law would be imposed, which did start to see a change specifically in the lives of women who had lived under the Dutch Republic. The fact is, the Dutch period didn't disappear (laughs) with the fall of the colony. People still spoke Dutch. They still continued to maintain the alliances they held under the Dutch. They still even did 
trade with Dutch regions of empire, like they're still trading in Curaçao, in South America. So you do see a kind of a maintenance of those ties. However, there are examples that are made of some merchants who don't toe the line during the English period, and they are having their holdings confiscated. And you do, as the period wanes on into the 18th century, start to see an erosion in population and in language of the Dutch character of the colony, although it never fully disappears and I think stays pretty strong all the way up through the 18th century. And in some cases, you do have the kind of language survival well past that. So it's kind of a gradual change, though this change is felt differently by different families. Like, for example, the Bayard family, who are the cousins of the Stuyvesant family, they really capitalize on this moment with Nicholas Bayard emerging as the kind of go-between. And he really makes a lot of money and gains a lot of power. And he does some things pretty prominently to shore up that power. He's not just allowing it to happen. He converts to Anglicanism and does take on some of the trappings of English colonial power. But he maintains his connections, both lineal and socially, to his Dutch forebears. I mean, his uncle is none other than Peter Stuyvesant. So you have examples, at least in the families I'm looking at, of people who are making the best of the moment and working different angles in order to maintain their family's prestige. As we are talking about the different ways that these elite Dutch families used enslavement and the practice of slavery to increase their wealth, I wonder if you could talk to us about a big change that you just touched upon, which is this change from Roman Dutch law to the laws of primogenitor in English common law. Could you tell us a bit about Roman Dutch law and its inheritance practices and how enslaved people were used in these inheritance practices? And then what it was like to switch to English common law and what its inheritance practices were and how this impacted enslaved people? I am so glad you brought this up because this shifting legal culture is one of, I would say, the most lasting changes and really starts to enact a shifting landscape of power that is in conversation with what happened before, but certainly different in a new system of control. In the Roman Dutch law context, you had the ability of people, no matter their gender, so if you were a daughter, you could inherit and then hold property in your own name. And much has been written about the freedom or the ability of women under this system in order to act in their own name and amass their own level of economic identity. Although this by no means is of Shangri-La for women in terms of quality in the system, you still have a patriarchal system. It was a way for women to continue to amass their own level of wealth. Now, with the fall of the colony and the imposition of the system that is marked by primogenitor, you've got women then being stripped of this role, of this ability. And so you have only men inheriting, and generally this is the eldest male. And so this changes the landscape of inheritance. It also changes for many of the families that I talk about I'm following ties that are going along not just male, but also prominently female lines. And it changes the control that such colonial women had over their financial lives. And of course, this includes their actions as enslavers. I have an example from the book of a woman who had been born under the Dutch rule, Elizabeth Stuyvesant Sydenham. She marries Nicholas Willem Stuyvesant who is Peter Stuyvesant's younger son, he dies. And she has been able to bring in land that she inherited from her family. And after she remarries under the English system to a man named George Sydenham, she is unable to hold on to these land holdings. And also, Sydenham actually exercises a certain degree of sadistic control over the people that she enslaves. So, you do get a change in terms of the ways that women who had existed under this Dutch system are able to work and live under the English system. 
Likewise, you get the imposition of slave codes that weren't in place in Dutch New Netherland in a formal way. You get a formalized system which stops certain things happening that were happening before. For example, enslaved people are not able to have freedom of movement that they were able to have. They are increasingly subject to systems of surveillance and control that are backed by law that you don't see in the earlier period. So this switch to the English legal system is one that does leave a mark on the society. But even with this switch, we do find instances, plenty of instances, where Dutch fathers find ways to pass on wealth to their daughters, at least for the first few generations under English law. But I wonder how this change to English law impacted a Dutch family's ability and strategy to create and pass on generational wealth through their enslaved people. Is this something you could tell us more about? This is an interesting question because even with the dawn of the English period, you still see these families with roots to the Dutch period passing down specifically enslaved people along both lines. So there is a continuity there where you have women inheriting enslaved people alongside their brothers. For example, when I'm looking at the Schuyler Livingston Alliance that's helmed most famously by Alita Schuyler Livingston, who was also married to Nicholas van Rensselaer before she marries Robert Livingston, her daughters are left enslaved people as well as her sons. And so while the sons really are the ones who go on to inherit the massive landholding that comes to be known as the Manor of Livingston, daughters are still being married off, obviously, to prominent people in the colony, but they're also being bequeathed enslaved peoples and, of course, with disastrous consequences for the enslaved who are trying to maintain their own family ties. So this kind of horrid continuity is one that really struck me as unique because I really thought there was going to be a cessation, really, of the importance of female lines with the dawn of English legal culture. But instead, I found that this practice was one that survived the change, the practice of bequeathing and handing down enslaved people along female lines as well was one that survived the fall of the colony and came to mark identities of these families well into the 18th century. And I think this is a good moment to talk about the implications of these inheritance practices for enslaved people. We've spent most of our conversation talking about the ways enslaved people enriched elite Dutch families, but the enslaved were real people. And we're talking about real people who were used in these families' plans to generate wealth. Most poignantly to me as I was doing this research was the story of family that really leapt off the page for me. And that was a family helmed by a woman named Diana. And in the Livingston family papers, the fate of her family comes through several generations all the way into her grandchildren. And what the cost was of these types of practices of handing people down like this. For example, when the eldest daughter, Margaret Livingston, was married off to Samuel Vetch, who incidentally became the governor of the colony of Nova Scotia. They actually moved to Boston and then ultimately briefly to Nova Scotia. And Diana's family was torn apart by this move because the Livingstons decided to send her youngest child to live with the Vetches in Boston. And it's very directly one of the Livingston daughters' requests that her mother send the child is promised. And then you don't hear anything about this clearly painful move until a case of a man who is being tried for attempting to kill his enslaver. And he's forced to admit his culpability and actually questioned by Robert Livingston about the involvement of Livingston's enslaved man named Ben. And Ben, it turns out, was this little girl's father. And the only thing that we learned from this kind of interrogation is that Ben was very sorry that Livingston had decided to send his daughter to the Vetches in Boston. And just that moment of thinking about when you're looking at these names on a page, that these are human beings. And to see their lives impacted like that, 
and the ruptures that are maintained and perpetuated by that is really quite tragic. And it comes through very clearly in the documents and the family papers that I look at. Thank you for sharing Diana's story with us and for really humanizing the people on the page for us. Now, if you take a step back and you think of all the different records that you've looked at and you look at the really large picture, what do you think the English conquest meant for Dutch slavery and its practice in what has now become New York, New Jersey, and Delaware? Well, I think that overall, the English conquest, it definitely evolved the networks in some senses. It created more opportunities for nascent ties that were happening under the Dutch period between the colonies, between the Northeast, and really the English conquest made those ties even stronger. In terms of slavery, it certainly solidified some of the practices that were only recognized in culture. For example, in a legal case that I include in the book, I talk about how under the Dutch context, there's an argument made by a colonist, Nicholas de Meyer, is angry because his case is being tried with a person who is either African or Indian who under law is invalid, he says. This is not the case. There was no law that actually said that. But he is intuiting that from the culture. These kinds of intuitive markers of difference become solidified under the English conquest. You get the laws, you get hardening of the culture in that sense. But that's not to say that these weren't aspects of culture that existed during the Dutch period, but rather that they became more codified and really had a larger birth under the English system. Before we move into the time warp, is there one thing that you'd really like us to walk away from this conversation, better understanding about New Netherland, its practice of slavery, and these elite Dutch families? I would like you to walk away from this interview thinking about the fact that this story of beginnings of economic gain, of the place of these families in our narrative, is one that does impact the lives of thousands of people and families and is, in some cases, in important ways, dependent on their place in the society as well. So they are making space for these European colonists in order to create wealth for themselves and their families. They are the wealth that are passed down. But at the same time, even though during the Dutch period, you have enslaved people who are able to gain their freedom and even as free people to gain land and then pass that down, this is something that gets cut off. So the ability that we see that makes these families memorable, that makes them powerful, the ability to network, to gain wealth, to gain resources, these are something that is predicated on, or at least braided within, the subsequent disenfranchisement, enslavement of people at the same time. So I would say that the story of slavery, even though it's not normally thought of as being a major part of these families' identities, is something that I think readers should reconsider. And I hope that that is something that would be a lasting impact that my book would have. Now we should move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. In your opinion, what might have happened if New Netherlands elite families had never become involved with slavery or the slave trade? How might the experience of slavery in early New York and in early North America have been different? I think that if these families had divested of slavery or it hadn't been a part of their portfolio at all, I'm loath to think that there would have been much of the expansion that we see in the 18th century in terms of the population of enslaved people in New York City and also the conversations around slavery like with the establishment of the newspaper and those kind of networks of communication, I think that would have looked very different. 
And if these northern elite families had not invested in enslavement, I often wonder whether the connections that were maintained from the southern colonies, the Caribbean colonies, networks of surveillance acted out on a kind of broader scale with the rise of the newspaper. I think it would have looked very different. I think it would have been a much more contained enterprise than what it became, which was, of course, a key engine and driver of the wealth and accumulation of the Americas. So, Nicole, what aspect of history are you researching and writing about now? Right now, I've been really captivated by the stories of early American women and their networks. So kind of touching on that question we talked about in terms of Anglo-Dutch law, the stories of these female enslavers, as well as the women whose lives were torn apart by these connections. But then also some of these women went on to do prominent things like Elizabeth Freeman, who was enslaved by a New York family and then moved into Massachusetts. This story is something that I find to be so fascinating. And also following the lives of early women is something that I will be looking at for my next project. And where is the best place for us to look for more information about you, your work, and how we can get in contact with you if we have questions? The best place to find more about my work is my website, which is www.nicolemaskeel.com. And I'm also on Twitter. And those are the two probably best places to find me. Nicole Maskeel. Thank you so much for joining us and for helping us better understand the institution of slavery in New Netherland and early New York and how these elite families in New Netherland were able to generate so much wealth based on their enslavement of others and their practice of slavery. Thank you so much for having me. As we continue to research and investigate the many contributions Africans and African-Americans made to the history, wealth and culture of both early America and the early United States. We need to do as Nicole advised us. We need to open our eyes and expand our perspectives so that we can see the multiple dimensions of enslavement. Enslaved Africans and African Americans built much of the wealth of what became the United States. Often we look at this wealth in terms of the produce of their labor, the iconic buildings that they constructed, the farm and plantation fields that they worked to produce cash and food crops out of, and their skills as artisans. But as we heard from Nicole, The wealth Africans and African-Americans built didn't just come from the crops, goods, and infrastructure they built. It also came from their bodies. Owning enslaved people helped New York's elite families project wealth. Enslaving a person gave white families social, political, and financial status. It also created a great demand from others who wanted to own enslaved people. This great demand, which elite white New Netherlanders and New Yorkers helped to create, allowed these same families to increase their wealth by investing in slaving voyages, voyages that brought new enslaved people to New Netherland and to North America more generally. Further, the great demand for enslaved people also imbued enslaved people with a financial value, a financial value that, for all intents and purposes, transformed enslaved human beings into tradable commodities and into forms of currency. As we heard from Nicole, Slaveholding families leveraged their enslaved people as surety for loans and capital that could be invested in other projects. The saying that it takes money to make money applies here. Only in this early American instance, it took enslaved people and the economic value ascribed to them by enslavers that enabled early Americans to make investments and secure loans that they otherwise could not afford to make or secure. Enslaved people built the wealth of their enslavers not only through the goods and crops they labored to produce, but from their literal bodies and being. Now, what did being used as markers of status, vessels of economic value, and laborers who produced economic value mean for the enslaved who lived in colonial New Netherland, New York, and elsewhere? It meant a life that was difficult and hard in all ways. It meant physical toil and damaged bodies. It meant the destruction of families and communities. And it meant the emotional hurt and mental anguish that goes along with being constantly watched, work, and living with the possibility that you and your loved ones might be separated and sold away at any time. There is a myth that being an enslaved person in early New York and in the early Northeast was a kinder form of enslavement. But research like Nicole's reveals that enslavement was 
always inhumane and cruel. It's just the cruelty looks a bit different depending on the regional practices of enslavement that you look at. Look for more information about Nicole, her book, Bound by Bondage, plus notes, links, and a transcript for everything we talked about today on the show notes page. BenFranklinsWorld.com slash 351. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. So if you enjoy Ben Franklin's World, please tell your friends and family about it. Production assistance for this podcast comes from my colleagues at the Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. Joseph Edelman, Holly White, and Ian Tonat. Great Master Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, this month our episodes are exploring the different ways that Africans and African Americans built the wealth of the United States. In our next episode, we'll explore the empowering life and deeds of James Fortin. So what other aspects along this topic would you like to explore? Please let me know. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios.